Hello guys, welcome back to another episode of Captured Killers. I am so excited to be here. My name is Kim and today we are covering the story of Candace Mosler. If you haven't heard of Candace Mosler, oh my gosh, you guys are in for a treat. If you're interested in true crime like I am, please hit that subscribe button. To everyone that's been supporting this series, thank you so much. I've been reading your comments. I see the subscribers. Thank you so much. It has been really good and I am fully enjoying this. I really have really gotten back into YouTube doing this series. I am having so much fun with it, so I'm glad that it's coming across okay. I mean, I'm still new, so I'm getting better at this, but first let's start with the comment of the day and it is from Fancy Pants. I just love that name. Hi, Fancy Pants. So many women, lots of things I did not know about him. Great job. Feel sorry for the wives and kids. This is from my Gary Ridgway video. I could not agree more. There's so many lives that were affected by him, but that's not what we're talking about today. We're talking about Candace Mosler. <laughs> Candace also went by the name Candy. So throughout this, I'll be calling her Candy. Candy's backstory is she came from a small town, a farm in Buchanan, Georgia. She was one of 12 siblings. From what I could tell, just had a, a normal poorish upbringing. I could imagine living on a farm with 12 and then their parents, I would imagine that they were pretty poor, but never graduated from high school, but she did end up getting married and having two children. But living in a small town, that just was not in the cards for Candy. She had big dreams. So she moved to New Orleans for a new start. And this is when she created the Candace Finishing and Modeling Agency and seemed to be doing pretty well with this modeling agency or finishing school. And she was now rubbing elbows with the elite and Candy was on her way. She was doing really well. Uh, and Candy was really involved in charity work and just committees in general. You could tell she was definitely a socialite. And so this got her to the opera. And the opera, what she did there was she would just work on donations. She was part of the donations committee. And she had a meeting with John Mosler and this is how Candace and Jack met. Who is Jax Mosler? And I'm not sure if I'm saying his name right, but he went by Jack a lot, so we're gonna call him Jack through this episode just to keep keep it all straight. Who Jack was, he grew up in a single parent home. His father had died when he was younger, and so he airplane. So he just really wanted to succeed in life. He wanted to make some money and he had no problem working for it. And so at a young age, he had dropped out of school. He started in the finance world. I think he started selling cars and then he ended up going into financing. And so he would do the more risky loans uh, with high interest rates, but it really, it really kicked it off for him. He, Jax was pretty well to do. Jack had been married uh, to his first wife. They ended up divorcing and they had four children together. So he already had four children, but was divorced and then met Candy. Despite the wide gap in age between Jack and Candace, there was just an instant spark with them. Uh, some reported that there was about a 20 year age difference. Candy was very secretive about what her age actually was. So we're just gonna say about 20 years. But they fell in love and were married in 1949 and they were seen as a great loving couple. And then around eight years into marriage, I won't get into that story, but they ended up adopting four orphaned children. They had been married for eight years. Jack was ready to slow down and they took in these four children. I just, that just shows me what a big heart they were. I mean, they it didn't sound like they were real selfish people. Uh, Candy came from a big family and so 
in loving arms they took these children in. So all is going well and Jack and Candy are seen as the idealistic relationship family. Their values were great. Jack would spoil Candy to death, just shower her with gifts, bought her a huge mansion. Outside looking in, they were the couple that everybody wanted to be. And then after 12 years of marriage comes in Melvin. Melvin Powers. So, Melvin. Candy's sister suggested to Melvin that he look up Candy, his aunt, Melvin's aunt, her sister, to see if she couldn't help him out. Now, he had just gotten out of jail. He went down the wrong path. He just sounds like a opportunistic piece of work. He had just gotten out of jail for a con that he had committed in Michigan. So, he was the get-rich-quick kind of guy. He wasn't uh, a build-from-the-bottom story. It's like he wanted to be rich and he'd do anything it took to get there. And you, you see that later, but it started with this first con that he did that he ended up getting caught for and ended up spending time in jail. So anyways, here we are. Melvin's mom is like, call Aunt Candy and see if she can't help you out. She's married to, you know, Jack, this rich businessman. Maybe he can offer you a job and you can go, go down to Texas. So that's what he does. He he calls Candy or the sister calls Candy. Somebody calls Candy and Candy said, come on down. There's plenty of room, 20-something uh, rooms in the mansion. Come on down. We'll get you set up. And that's what they did. So Melvin moves in to the Texas mansion with Candy and Jack. He starts uh, working as a trailer salesman. So he's working for the company. He's staying rent-free in the mansion. Things are going great. In the meantime, Jack had had some health issues, and so he was staying at their Florida home. Now, they had two homes. They had one in Texas, and then they had one in Florida, and Jack did business in both places as well. So it wasn't unheard of for, for Jack to go spend time in Florida. Well, he was spending more time there because of these health issues, and so this left Candy a lot of time. So what does she do? The unspeakable is what she does. Jack um, is like, he's suspecting something is going on uh, with Candy, that she may be having an affair. Well, he was super surprised when the staff from the Texas home came to him. Either it was the staff or it was a friend. There was a couple different articles that I read that are different. But anyway, somebody told Jack in Florida, hey, you might want to check on Candy because I think she has a relationship with her nephew. She's sleeping with her blood nephew, having an affair, adulterous, incestuous affair with her nephew. Jack is uh, had already had his suspicions that something is going on, so he goes to the Texas home. He's looking for evidence, and he finds Candy's diary. And in this diary, she talks about this incestuous affair with Melvin. And so it's confirmed Jack is, is just appalled, and he confronts them about it. They couldn't really deny it, so... Jack end up, ends up going to see a lawyer. He's like, I want to sue Melvin for ruining my marriage. They have been married 12, 13 years at this point. 12, 13, 14 years at this point, and, and Melvin is ruining their relationship. So he went to go see a lawyer. The lawyer said, this is going to look really bad for everybody. I wouldn't follow through with it. His advice was just to fire him and get him out of the house. And so that's what he does. He and Melvin loses his job and he's evicting him from the Texas home. But Melvin being the piece of work that he is, he's not gonna leave quietly. Oh no, he's not. So they had to, of course, get him physically, you know, not physically, but they had to have him removed from the house. His last words were, I have a couple different articles that say different things, but for the most part, he said, I'll be back. Basically threatening Jack. This plays a huge role later as well. 
he leaves the Texas mansion and then now Jack is separated, officially separated from Candy and he's living in the Florida home. He didn't want to divorce Candy because she would get half and Candy didn't want to divorce him because the prenup that they had set up, she would only receive $200,000 and that was just not enough for Candy. She, she wanted she wanted way more. So she wasn't going to file. So they were married, but they were living in separate homes. So in June 1964, Candy brings the four children to visit Jack in the Florida home. And she's over visiting. And then around 1 a.m., she says that she's going to the hospital. Now, Candy had suffered from migraines in the past, so it wasn't un uncommon for her to seek medical treatment for these migraines. But what's odd about this is that she has, they have a ton of money. Like they can hire a doctor to come out no matter what the hour is to give her some medicine or do whatever she was seeking. Like she didn't need to physically take her children. She took all four children out of the house with her to go to an emergency room is what she told Jack that she was doing. So she leaves the house, but only drives around. She never even ended up at the emergency room with her four children during the night. So me meanwhile, somebody breaks into Jack's home and the scene is gruesome. He was found dead. He had uh, been struck in the head with a glass object and he was stabbed 39 times. And so the neighbors heard the dog barking and they seen a man fleeing the scene. Jack was found in only his robe. He didn't have, you know, other clothes on. It's, it's late in the night. It's between 1 and 4.30. So it's late in the evening. He you know, some people sleep naked. What's the big deal? But anyways, they found this fishy or whatever that he only had his robe on. So Candy returned to the house around 4, 4.30. And of course, the cops were called. They came out and inspected the scene. And what the cops found out in this case. Okay, so let's talk about all the evidence that they found. They found a palm print a bloody palm print. They found the car that Candy had signed out. It was later reported stolen, but it was found at an airport. Melvin had just happened to fly in that day prior to the murder and flew out right after. So they were able to prove that he was in the area. They were able to prove that he was at a motel bar, a Holiday Inn bar, just around last call. Um, I don't know what time it closed, but anyways, he was right there in the area. And in the car that they found at the airport, they found a bloody fingerprint. So immediately, they're looking at Melvin. This is prior to them knowing it's his fingerprints or whatever. They just knew he was in the area. And they had found Jack's diary. And in his diary, he had stated that if they don't kill me first... I'm gonna have to kill them and talked about their affair. And so he knew what was going on and he felt threatened by them. He clearly wrote that in his diary. So all this evidence was just piling up. I mean, it was just not looking good for Candy and Melvin. So that, that next day they arrest Melvin. They're like, something's going on here, we know it. And they got Melvin's clothes and they found blood splatter on his clothes. Now this was in the 1960s. There wasn't the DNA DNA evidence that we're able to prove today. They didn't have that at the time. So it was all circumstantial. Was it though? Anyways, so they considered it circumstantial evidence, but he had blood on him. He had been in the area. Uh, Candy was in the area. She had um, signed out the car that was later reported stolen in a, at an airport or by an airport. And so what does Candy do? She hires the best attorney she could for Melvin. And this attorney wants $200,000 to even work on his case. Well, all of the assets are frozen. She has no money to pay him. So what does she do? She has him come over and go through her jewelry, her furs. And these were all items 
that Jack had purchased for her, <laughs> which is just, just so mind-blowing. With the gifts that he got her, she is paying to get off the guy that killed him. Like, is what? Anyways, this it's so this case gets me so fired up. I was literally talking to my niece about it and I'm like screaming. Like she's looking at me like I'm a crazy person, but I get so worked up about this case because it's it's just mind blowing. But anyways, they then arrest Candy. Candy's under arrest because she has a clear motive. If he dies, then she gets he was worth about 33 million. She would get 33 million dollars. The motive was there. The affair was there. There was just so many reasons that would benefit both Candy and Melvin because they were in this incestuous relationship. It's crazy. She was arrested. She hires a couple of attorneys as well. And then the trial begins. And the trial is just a circus. There is so many people. And uh, Candace was like a, a southern hospitality belle. She was like very sweet, um, baby honey, sugar, and she she was well liked. And actually, when I was watching, I was like, wow, you know, she just seems so nice. You know, she's saying that she thinks Miami's a great town and they're just, there's great people there, you know, talking about the jurors and whatnot. So she just came across as super sweet, you know? So she went, she did have a finishing school. So she was probably trained or trained herself how, anyways. So during the trial, they were able to bring up all the evidence. They brought in evidence that both Candace and Melvin had tried to hire two cons, two men, to solicit them to kill her husband with $10,000. But these men presented themselves as hairlicks. Like, just basically, that was the term of the... They were just cons, and they talked about how they shot up drugs and were discredited. And especially in this time, these two people said, she tried to pay me. But they seen it that these men ha were locked up in jail and they were getting a free ticket to Miami. So they would they would plead guilty to anything. So I guess they brought out the love letters that were between Candy and Melvin. They brought in Jack's diary. And then now they have proof that the palm print and the fingerprint in the car both matched Melvin. Uh, the neighbors seen a man fleeing the scene from Jack's house right after the murder. They knew it was a man. And so everything was stacking up, like it was a prosecutor's dream. They had pretty much everything except for an eyewitness. Like it, it was looking so good. So what ended up happening is Candace said that Jack had fallen ill and became a homosexual. And so, which is just absurd. He may have been, I don't know. I mean, stranger things have happened. It's not even that big of a deal, like who cares? But because he was found when, in only his robe, they were thinking that it was just one of the many, because Candace said that he would bring men home or she would come home and Jack would be with a different man. And this happened on several occasions. So defense attorney was stating that this was probably just one of his gay lovers because Jack was only in his robe that, whatever, that's a stretch. I mean, it could, no, I don't, anyways. So they just started, the defense just started poking holes into the case and the jury came back and found them not guilty. I just don't even see how that's possible. But during this time, during the trial, it's a circus. It's a zoo. It is all over the news. There is reporters flying in from everywhere. They just all wanted a front seat to the charade. I mean, you had sex, drugs, you know, incest, affairs. It, you, it just the tri quadruple facta of things that people wanted to see and report on. And so it was just a media circus. The, apparently, like the courtroom, if people were packing lunches, and then if two people got up, 
the the bailiff would be like okay two more i have a, you know i have a couple seats open here you know if you want to come in and have a seat which is just it's crazy i guess like the oj the trial was kind of that way too but anyways it, for the 1960s it was it was pretty crazy ended up that um they found him like i said not guilty they got away with it and i just don't know how so they are found not guilty everybody's going crazy i'm just like what they start picking up the pieces candy throws a party and you would think that they would end the affair because candy and jack would end the affair because you know they've been outed and maybe they can do some pr stuff to try to clear it up and you know oh it's just rumors blah 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 oh no oh no they stay together for another year. Like how, how, how does that dynamic work? Like, do they have Christmas with their families? Like, what do they say? Like how, was it acceptable? I, I'm confused. I have no idea what that dynamic looks like. The whole public knows that it's her nephew and they stay together. Like there's pictures of them holding hands. They're going on vacations together. It's just mind blowing. Oh boy, confusing. Anyway, so they end up splitting and Candy ends up remarrying. She remarried. This man ends up falling off of the mansion's balcony and suffering a brain trauma. So he just wasn't the same. And so Candy was like, okay, I don't want to deal with you. So they ended up getting a divorce. Oh, and she changes the name of the company to Candace Mosler Enterprises. See, I was giving Candy the benefit of the doubt. I'm like, maybe she was influenced by Melvin because Melvin's the opportunist. And so he was like, yeah, you need to do this. You need to get all that money. So I was like, maybe she was just, you know, smitten by her nephew and he's trying to talk her into this but when i heard that she changed the company's name to her own name i was like oh oh candy you're a bad bad person <laughs> that's she didn't even want to keep her husband's legacy going like what is that all about so she she ended up just changing the name to her own name weird and during this time the community is is asking the cops you know are you investigating anybody else about you know and the cop is like no we already know who did it we're not gonna waste resources to try to find another murder we know who did it they just got off so they didn't even put any resources to try to follow any other leads because it was clear who had done it the motive was there the evidence was there but it wasn't enough um for the jury do you think the jury was paid off? I think the jury was paid off. Melvin goes on. He never marries. Candace, like I said, she married, but uh, ended up leaving him. And Candy ended up dying when she was around 55, 56 years old. She uh, had a drug overdose from her migraine medicine. but And she was found in only her robe with a full face of makeup, but... So anyways, she died during her sleep um, from a drug overdose. And I think that's karma. Did she have a guilty conscience? I think she might have. She might have. I'm not sure. It could have just been an accident because, like I said, she had migraines. But why did she have migraines? The brain is a mysterious thing. She dies. Melvin brings um, some mysterious woman, cute little blonde, younger girl, to her funeral. Uh, he ends up dying at like 68. His cause of death was undetermined. Who knows why he died? He was 68, so I don't know. But uh, Melvin went on to, after after the trial, he stayed with Candy for a year and then Candy helped him out with his business. And so he was worth like $200 million as being a Texas real estate developer and so he ended up doing great things it really worked out for him candy ended up tripling the size of the mosler enterprises i don't know why i said it like that but anyways so she ended up doing well as well so uh well not really because she ended up dying not too long after but so that's everything that i know about this case 
What a crazy story. I seen this on Bailey Syrian's channel and I hate copying stuff that's freshly done. It was done like five months ago. You know, it's like, are you copying? But it was so interesting to me and I had done all the research. So I'm like, or, you know, I've watched so much and read some articles. I'm like, I'm gonna go ahead and do this video. <laughs> so if you wanna see hers, I'll link it down below. She's the one that really introduced me to this story and it's just crazy. I really think that the jury was paid off. I just really do. I just don't think there's no ands, ifs, or buts about it. It was 1960. I think it's harder now to pay off the jury, although there's crazier things that happen today that people get off that you're like, what? I just really think that they were guilty and they got away with it. Insane. So sad. So sad. Poor Jack. So let me know your thoughts down below. Do you think that they were innocent? Do you think that they paid off the jury. There was something going on. Crazy, crazy, crazy. That's the story of Candace and Jax Mosler. I don't know why I say his name like that, Mosler. Thanks so much for watching, you guys. Have a great day, and I'll see you in my next one. Bye.